Other questions? Then? <coughs> Sir? I had a question about doing a reciprocal cross. Okay. Um, say if you had someone that was um, uh, X dominant Y, and then someone that was, um, or uh, say you had someone that was a girl that was X, uh, that was heterozygous, and then you had a guy. That for, for an X dominant trait? I just want to make sure. So, yeah. okay, so we're talking about X dominant, you want to have. A girl who's heterozygous, so x plus over x minus, yeah. so she's going to show the trait, because it's x dominant, right, so that minus is the mutant version that gives her that trait. Okay, so what else? And then say um, the male was um, recessive, how would you switch the, the genotypes? So the male, in this case... Doesn't sh what you mean by recessive is doesn't show the phenotype. Okay, so this is it, right. So we've got his genotype. Then he's got a Y chromosome and he's got an X. And if he doesn't show the phenotype, is he X plus or X minus? Where plus is wild type, minus is the mutant version. If he doesn't show the phenotype, then he's got the normal version or the plus or the wild type version of the X chromosome. Okay. So we could look at their pedigree, and then what you're asking about is what, what is the reciprocal cross? So this is how you tell whether or not something is a sex-linked trait or not. You look for different, ex different inheritance patterns when you have a reciprocal cross. So in this case, what is the reciprocal cross? Or what would it look like in human pedigree? Right, so you basically you switch who's affected. This is not always what reciprocal cross means, but this is what reciprocal cross means when we talk about pedigree analysis. You just want to see for two different independent pedigrees, when the male is affected, how does that trait transmit to his offspring? When the female is affected only, how does that trait transmit to her offspring? So just for simplicity, let's assume that we're looking crosses that make the same amount of males and females for siblings in the F1 generation. How will this trait, trait transmit in the top? So we're going to do the reciprocal crosses. Can we predict what we might expect? Now that we know, and this is one of two ways to ask pedigree questions. One is, I tell you the inheritance pattern, and I ask you to draw in what you expect to see in the next generation. That's what we're about to do. The other type of question I like to ask is, I show you the full pedigree with the colors, symbols filled in or not in all the generations, and I ask you to tell me, What's the inheritance pattern? So this is one of those two types of questions. So in the top pedigree, what's the easiest thing to start with? Should we start looking at how the male transmit his genes to the next generation or how the mom transmit her genes? Which one's easier? The male. Because we know who got which of his chromosomes. Who got his Y chromosome? His sons. Right, so his sons all got his Y. And the daughters all got his good copy of the X chromosome. So those all came from the male. I'm going to change the color here to track chromosomes. So I'm going to do X plus in red. Okay. So his good copy of his X chromosome, we know, has to go to all of his daughters.
Now, what about mom? How do her two X chromosomes get passed on to the kids? What, if any, information do we know about what we might expect those X chromosomes to do when they're inherited by the next generation? So say that louder. 50%. So 50% of the offspring should get one of her two X chromosomes. The other 50%, on average, will get the other X chromosome. Do we know which of these four kids will get the X plus or the X minus? No. We just have to randomly assign them. So what would it look like if we randomly distributed the X plus and the X minus to four kids? Let's say that male got her X plus. So we might say that on average, you'd expect the other 50% of the males to get mom's minus version of the X chromosome. All right, so you randomly distribute mom's two chromosomes to all of her kids, and they should be distributed equally, evenly among the sexes as well. So that means these two individuals get an X minus and an X plus. And this is not the only way to fill this in. So this is a very open-ended question, multiple possible genotypes that you could come up with in this second generation. But this is an acceptable version of an answer. So what are the phenotypes of these individuals? So this guy, x plus over y, affected or not? All together now, no. Affected or not? Not, right? Because he's got a plus x chromosome. It's not the mutation bearing x chromosome. So we leave his symbol open. What about this sister? Affected or not? What did we say this was, x dominant or x recessive? We said this is X dominant, right? So that means she's got one bad version of the X chromosome, the minus, so she's affected. Okay. What about the second brother, X minus over Y? He's got one dominant mutation that causes a disease or phenotype, so he's affected. And then the fourth sister, fourth sibling, plus over plus, wild type. So what happens when you do the reciprocal cross? What's the genotype of the male in the bottom, the, the father? He's got an X chromosome and he's got a Y chromosome. What version of the X does he have? Minus. He's got the phenotype. That's why his symbol's filled in. So we know his genotype is X minus over Y. What does mom's genotype have to be if this is X dominant? She can't have any minuses, right, so she's X plus over X plus. If she had even one X minus, her symbol would be filled in. She'd show the trait. Okay. So this is the reciprocal cross. What's the pattern going to be in the next generation? Dad passes his Y chromosome to all of his sons, which means he passes what to all of his daughters? X minus. This is a, if this is a dominant trait, what does that mean the pedigree, the inheritance pattern is going to look like? Who's going to be affected? Already, we know for sure all of his daughters, by definition, get his X chromosome. And if he's got a bad, bad X chromosome, then all of his daughters are going to show the phenotype. Even if the mom is homozygous for plus, yeah, she contributes X plus to every single individual. But that's not enough to rescue anybody from a dominant mutation. The recipro reciprocal cross. What's the difference? What's the difference in outcomes in the second generation? How does the pattern differ? Hmm? So it passes from fathers to 100% of daughters, exactly, in the bottom. Is that rule true for the top pedigree? No. Mothers don't pass only to sons. Mothers don't pass only to daughters. 
when it's excellent dominant, mothers pass the trait 50-50 equal ratio to her offspring. Males only pass it to their daughters. That's an example of the type of cross-direction specific or reciprocal cross-specific effect you look for to diagnose if something's sex-linked or not. This is the case of X-linked dominance. Correct. So if this was X recessive, then you'd have to have X minus over X minus to be a filled in symbol. Right, so how would you, yeah, you can't distinguish, it's an excellent point. If I just show you what's on the top, just this pedigree, and you don't know what the inheritance pattern is, what's, what else could it be? What else, what other inheritance pattern could this be if I don't show you what's down here? Could be, probably could be autosomal recessive. It's more likely could be not X dominant, but autosomal dominant. So you only, you diagnose exactly sex-linked inheritance by looking at both cross directions and reciprocal crosses. If I don't give you two pedigrees, and then what are you to do? If I only show you in a question, here's a pedigree, what's the inheritance pattern? What, how should you answer? How am I going to grade that? You better answer both. Say, I don't know. It, it's either X dominant or autosomal dominant. And if you want to really go for the gusto, then you also write down on your exam, I would need to see the reciprocal cross to be able to distinguish the two. You wouldn't have to do that. I would just be looking for, did you settle on one answer if you're going to pick one answer, if it's a multiple choice, like if I show you a pedigree and it says it's either, which one is it? Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-link dominant, X-link recessive. You can pick one. You can pick more than one. If you pick more than one, then that's fine. Because there will be, and there are sometimes, when human geneticists and animal geneticists and plant geneticists look at pedigrees and they don't have enough information to know for sure. So one of the things I want to know is, do you understand the patterns of inheritance well enough so that you can recognize when you're not sure, when you don't have enough information? Right? That's the mark of an A student. Anybody can answer a multiple choice question. That's easy. But do you know when to pick more than one answer? Would anybody like to see this example as an X recessive? Or should we move on to other questions? I'm happy to do either. I'm just suggesting options. So is it possible that this top pedigree pattern represents an X-linked recessive trait? What do we normally look for to diagnose recessive inheritance patterns?
So if we want to do an X-linked recessive inheritance pattern, who should we fill in? You tell me. You want dad or mom or both or neither? Try to come up with a pedigree that stumps me. What's true of recessive pedigrees, generally speaking? If I show you a pedigree, what's the first thing to look at to diagnose recessive pedigree? OK, does it skip a generation? So let's do one that breaks the rules. Is this a possible inheritance pattern of an excellent recessive trait? Bless you. Can we do this? Let's find out. Bless you again. So could this be an X-linked recessive pedigree? It's not skipping a generation. So what sort of genotypes would we have to hypothesize exist in these individuals to make this X-linked recessive? Let's pick on the daughter that's affected. If this is recessive, what does her genotype have to be if she's got the disease? It's recessive. So it's X minus over X minus. She has to have right, both bad mutant versions of the X chromosome to have this disorder. What does it take to be an affected male? Well, you only get one X chromosome. So his X must be <coughs> minus. What do we know about the genotypes of the two siblings on the right that aren't affected? OK, so they could be, they're either heterozygous or homozygous wild type. So there are two choices. We have to, we may or may not be able to figure out which of these two is true for both of those siblings. They're either homozygous wild type or they're heterozygous. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's for that sibling. For the male, indeed. Do we know his genotype? He has to have an X plus. He has to have a Y. OK. I'm human. I'm not foolproof. So if this is X recessive, we've already got the genotypes of three out of the four siblings. Can we figure out what the parent genotypes are? This is what we'd have to do to test if this is X linked recessive. All you do is you try to figure out all the genotypes. And if you can, make all, if you can fill in all the genotypes, then you've got an X linked recessive. It's a possibility. You don't know it's X linked recessive, but it's consistent with being X linked recessive. So what's mom's? Well, let's start easy. What's dad's genotype? Same as his son. If you're going to be an affected male of an X-linked recessive disorder, it has to be a mutant X chromosome. Okay. So he's going to pass his Y chromosome to his sons, which means he passes his X chromosome to his daughters. That means which of these two genotypes is the daughter's genotype. It has to be the one that's got an X minus in it because that's the only X chromosome she could inherit from her father. Okay, so we know that she's a carrier. What about mom's genotype? Is she heterozygous or is she homozygous? We know she's not homozygous minus because then she'd have a filled in symbol. Did we have enough information to figure out her genotype? Yes. 
So what's the essential difference? We want to know, does she have an X minus or not? Is she a carrier or is she homozygous wild type? What does she have to be, carrier or wild type? Right, she has to be a carrier because one son here on the left got an X minus from somebody, and it wasn't his dad because his dad gave him the Y chromosome. So his bad X chromosome had to come from his mom. So mom must also be a carrier. So at this point, we have unambiguously figured out the genotypes of all of these individuals. We know all of their genotypes. And we've been doing this genotype assignment based on the hypothesis in our minds that this is an X-linked recessive trait. So we haven't proven that this is X-linked recessive. All we know is that it could be X-linked recessive. Because we can invent genotypes that would make sense given that inheritance pattern. Could it be autosomal dominant? And this is exactly how I solve these problems when I'm dealing with them as well. You go through every pattern. You just ask, is it consistent with the data you have, or is it not? When you find something that doesn't work, then you know it's not that inheritance pattern. So you rule out the inheritance patterns that it can't possibly be based on the inheritance. So could this be autosomal dominant? could be recessive, even though it doesn't skip a generation, because mom's a carrier. What would dad's genotype have to be if this is autosomal dominant? Is he plus over minus, or is he minus over minus? Either of those genotypes would make him affected if this is a dominant trait. What would be true if he was minus over minus? He has to pass that trait to all of his offspring, but that's not the case here. So we know he's not minus over minus. His genotype, if this is autosomal dominant, would have to be plus over minus. What would mom's genotype be then? It's a dominant trait, and she's not affected. Right, she would have to be wild type, plus over plus. Right, if she had even one minus, she would show the trait. So in short, the kids could each, the infected kids could inherit the minus from their dad. The other two could inherit the plus from their dad. And that would give us our expected half the kids get the minus, half get the plus. Mendel's rules. Dad's a heterozygote. He passes one allele to half of his kid, the other allele to the other half of his kid. And then everybody gets pluses from mom. And that's perfectly consistent with the phenotypic data that we have. The two affected kids each have a minus. The unaffected kids are both plus over plus. So we could invent a scenario where this could just as likely be autosomal dominant. So this is either X recessive or autosomal dominant. We haven't ruled anything out yet. So when I ask you something like circle all of the possible inheritance patterns this could be, so far you've circled A and B, and then you have to go on to could it be X-linked recessive, could it be autosomal, or sorry, could it be autosomal recessive, could it be x dominant? Do you want to move on to translation, more about transcription? Splicing, capping, polyvinylation. Try to jog your memory in case some of these things seem less well described than others. Using a codon table.
What's the rule for X-linked recessive traits? We talked about X-linked dominance. Affected dads pass it to all their daughters. Affected moms pass it to their kids equally frequently. What's the rule here? Affected dad. How do his kids inherit the pattern? Equally frequently, sons and daughters. How does an affected mom with an X-linked recessive trait pass it to her kids? Usually. So if you looked at the reciprocal cross for X recessive, what would it look like? What's dad's genotype? We're talking about sex link traits. We write in X and Y. Which version of the X does he have? Plus, he's not affected. Okay. But which chromosome does he pass to his sons? Y. He passes his X to all of his daughters. And what do all the kids get from their mom? Guarantee, she's homozygous, they all have to get X minus. So who shows the trait? It's recessive, but males don't have this gene on their Y chromosome. So they only get one copy of whatever gene is mutated. It's on the X chromosome. So any male that gets a bad X chromosome shows the trait. And the females are all carriers. So it's the opposite. That's the reciprocal cross. So when X recessive traits, affected moms pass it to all of their sons and all of their daughters are carriers. So now we've, now we've gone through the whole thing. We've done X dominant reciprocal crosses. We've done X recessive reciprocal crosses. And if you want, make yourself a little cheat sheet, put it on your tablet, bring it to the exam. You know, make a little table. These are the patterns that typify the different inheritance patterns. X dominant, affected dad, what happens? Affected mom, what happens? X recessive, affected dad, what's the pattern? Affected mom, what's the pattern? Any final questions? Yeah. Okay. So a transcription. We've got a question about the branch point, the three splice site. So you've got a messenger RNA or an RNA molecule written five prime to three prime, as usual. So let's say this primary transcript, hot off the presses, RNA polymerase just produced this RNA molecule. It hasn't been capped, spliced, tailed yet. It's a primary transcript. There's one intron in here. Let's find it.
except I don't want T's, I want U's. Wow, that's a lot of writing. Sorry, everybody that's trying to copy that down. I'll read it for you quickly. G C A U G G C. You can see it. Okay, so here's a primary transcript sequence. RNA polymerase just produced it. What are we going to look for if I say, where are the introns? Or if I tell you there's one intron in here, what do we look for to find the intron? Okay, so a GU. That's the five prime splice site. Really, honestly, that's supposed to be a C. Okay, what's the three prime sequence that we look for? GU and then AG. So if anything is going to get taken out of this messenger RNA, or this, sorry, RNA molecule, it's not messenger RNA yet, it has to be processed before it's messenger RNA, what part's going to get cut out? Where are the splice sites? <coughs> well, in this case, I totally cleverly only included one of each of these sequences. There's a GU there, and then we want to look to the three prime direction to find where are the possible three prime splice sites. Except I wasn't so clever. Let's change that last G to an A. So in this case, there's only one five prime splice site and one three prime splice site. So what's the messenger RNA sequence going to look like? After this primary transcript has capped, spliced, and tailed, what RNA molecule are we going to wind up with from the five prime end? What's going to be the first? Eukaryotic RNA, it's about to be processed. What gets added on the five prime end? OK, so we're going to say there's a cap. Then what? So let's say that intron gets taken out. OK, so GC, we're going to start reading from the five prime end. C. And then what happens in splicing is that whole intron gets removed. And the two exons, the things that are flanking the intron, get stuck together, spliced together. Right? That's why it's called splicing. So what comes after that C that's not part of the intron? U. U, A, A. And then presumably there would be some other nucleotides in here, which I'm just going to call ends, because I, it's any nucleotide. I didn't specify them. At some point, there would be an AAUAAA. That's the polyadenylation signal sequence. Then there would be 15 to 20 more nucleotides. And then you would find the poly A tail. Just a string of A's that get added on separately. And that would be the three prime end of that. Now, messenger RNA. It's been capped, spliced, and it had its poly A tail added. We started with a primary transcript. We've ended with a messenger RNA. Now, I didn't address the question about the branch point. So we talked about the five prime splice site and the three prime splice site, G U A G. What's the branch point? An A in the middle. You're right. So I would say maybe that's that A. It's always hard to tell which one's the branch point. But there's going to be a conserved that is always present A somewhere in between the 5 prime and the 3 prime splice sites. So now we have a messenger RNA. CAP, GCA, UGG, CUU, et cetera. 
Quick, translate it. If this is eukaryotic, what's the first codon in this transcript? Methionine, AUG. So like the ribosome, you read from left to right until you hit the first AUG. That's methionine. Somebody playing Mario Brothers while we're doing transcription translation? Am I supposed to like jump or something like that? <laughs> What's the next amino acid? If anybody happens to have a codon table open, GCU. Alanine. So we've spelled ma. What's UAA? Stop. So here we had a transcript that encoded two amino acids, methionine, alanine, and then there was a stop codon. If, five minutes left, this is the most important piece of wisdom I can give you because this is what I see every term on this test. If I say, here's a messenger RNA sequence, please translate it, which reading frame do you not want to start with? You do not want to say, I know I start with the first letter in the messenger RNA and start translating using the codon table. Eh. Wrong answer. Don't do that. Look for the first AUG and start there. At least a quarter of students every semester start reading the first three letters. They say, OK, I'm just going to use the codon table and translate this thing without looking for the start codon. You know what I say to that? Ugh. That's not a stop codon, but still. You're going to get the wrong protein if you don't act like a ribosome and look for the first AUG and start there. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Most of you won't do that, but some of you will. So the ends, I mean, I didn't specify which of the four nucleotides they were. So it could, I could write in a specific sequence there if I wanted to. But that's a, an excellent question maybe to end on. We've got about two or three minutes left. So where on this, using this example, where are the untranslated regions, the UTRs, which were in the messenger RNA sequence but not translated by the ribosome? Right. So the five prime untranslated region, it's everything before the first, before the start codon. Everything to the left of the start codon is 5 prime untranslated region. Right down here. And then everything after the stop codon is the 3 prime untranslated region. It's part of the messenger RNA molecule, but the ribosome never touches it. Because as the ribosome moves along this sequence, once it hits the stop codon, the ribosome gets kicked off of the messenger RNA molecule. It never goes any farther than that, reading the messenger RNA. So none of the rest of those nucleotide sequences ever touch a ribosome. It's untranslated. All right. So we've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to hang out for a couple minutes in case one of you wants to come up and ask a question. And I've got office hours now for an hour and a half. <laughs>